Hallelujah. Jesus. We are going on a men's retreat this Friday night. Amen. And then, ladies, if you need your man to be transformed, <laughs> you need to send him on this retreat. It's going to be awesome. And how often do the men get off on a retreat? Not very often. So uh, we're going to leave Friday at 4.30. We need you to sign up so we know how many bands to bring. Um, we have one band going now, so we have more people signed up. We already have 21 people signed up. We have nine golfers signed up. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then when we get there, and we're leaving at 4.30, when we get there, we're going to start eating barbecue until we're just overdosed. <laughs> we're going to overdose on meat. And then... You know, men like me. So then, then we're going to have, have Bobby Bowden. We're going to have a service, have a band, a really good band. We're going to worship. We're going to have Bobby Bowden speak. And then we're going to play uh, putt-putt and bowling until late in the evening. And uh, then we're going to come home in the morning. Some people are staying for a golf tournament. So if you want to be a part of that, it's going to be really a lot of fun. So we need you to sign up down the hallway in the back. Amen? Yeah. This week, I heard, Rachel told me that we're supposed to wear blue this week in support of our troop, or not the troops, in support of the uh, police officers. So, uh, paint the bar blue. Paint the bar blue. Is it this week, like the rest of this week, or is it next week? The weekend, I think. Oh, the weekend, okay. So just start wearing blue. Yes. <laughs> Especially, we needed that after the uh, police officer was killed just yesterday and the other day, so that's really sad. Blue ribbon on your mailbox. Blue ribbon on your mailbox, okay. Not many professions where you're not sure if you're going to come home. Again. So, you need to support our police today, man. Wow, today's a big day. I need some men to help me pass the stuff out. Wood. Did, did you bring your sheets back from last week? Yes. Okay. Split those in half. Raise your hand if you need a sheet. We've got two sheets. One has color on it. One is black and white. You need both of them. We need both of them. Yes. Okay. Don't get it. We have an extra. I think we have an extra. One. So.
Wouldn't it be great to have a year where we don't work and we get our debts just wiped away? Yeah. And, and, and God knew that people get in debt. God knew that we need a time to start over. God knew that we needed a year off. Right? God knows that. And, and so we had the Shemitah year, which was every seven years you took, you let the land grow, a uh, lay fallow, and then you also took the year off. So you had the, every seven years you had the day off, and every 50 years you had the year off. So a year off, and 50 years is a year off again. And it gave people a chance to study God's Word and do more cerebral, cerebral or artistic things. Because in the agrarian culture, man, the farm dictated their life. They were working all the time, up early, late. So once in a while they got a chance to, I'm going to spend a year, I'm going to study God's Word. God's laid something on my heart. I'm just going to take a year off and I'm going to study this. Everybody else is laid off, you know, so it'll be a great time where we can just relax. We have a sabbatical. And uh, God knows we need that, amen? Yeah. God works six days and we rest. So rest is really important in the body of Christ. How many know people who never rest? They work like seven days a week and never rest. That's wrong. It's not good for you physically, yeah. spiritually, or emotionally. You need to take a day off. And, and, and so the Sunday is our day off. We take that off and we worship the Lord and we come to church and remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So take a day. Paul said it doesn't matter what day you take. Take a day and, and rest and worship the Lord. So uh, Monday the 28th is Sukkot. That's how you say it. I looked it up. <laughs> S-U-K-K-O-T but the T is pronounced like an S. Sukkot is uh, it's Monday, this coming Monday, the 28th. It's the Feast of Boots. It's also the fourth blood moon. Okay, you've been hearing about the blood moon. We've been talking about the blood moon. Okay, so um, this Monday is the last blood moon, and it's uh, going to be interesting. And blood moon is basically a lunar eclipse that turns the moon kind of a reddish color. They call it blood moon. And so we talked last week, you remember, were you here last week? We talked about two judgments. What were the two judgments we talked about? Raise your hand. I'll call on you. Yes, what was one of them? Just one. Just one. Bema seat judgment. Right. She was paying attention. What was the other? So we had the Bema seat judgment. Who was that reserved for? Christians. Okay, the Bema seat judgment is where the Christians, their works are judged. It's more like uh, the Bema seat was what happened in the Olympics where there was a judge and then the gold, the bronze, and the silver, and they're on the platform. And so they're all getting awards. They called it the Bema Seat. So we Christians, we're going to get, get to heaven. We're all going to get rewards. We're going to be on that, that platform. Gold, silver, bronze. And so our works will be judged. And so what was the other judgment? The great, great white throne. Right. And that's reserved for the unbelievers. Okay. The unbelievers, the great white throne. That happens at the almost right at the very end. So we talked about Revelation. We read Revelation 4, 5, and 6. We went to the first seal. Let me ask you. Okay, we started the, the judgments or of the seals. Someone opened the seals, took the scroll. Remember they said, who is worthy to open the seal? No one stepped forward. He cried and cried. John cried and cried. No one's worthy to open the seal. Who finally came forward and opened the seal? Took the scroll. Right? The Lamb, which was Jesus. Okay? He was the only one worthy to open the seals. And he opens the first seal, and what came out? Were you guys here last week? Maybe I didn't <laughs> preach, teach good. Maybe I'm unfair. The first seal of the seven seals is the Antichrist. Okay? The Antichrist, first, first seal. So, Said he came out on a white horse, he had a crown, right? A lot of people think that's Jesus. But Jesus is opening all the seals, so he couldn't be one of the seals. And I'm not talking about a seal, like, we're talking about seals that seals a book or a scroll. So he, Jesus opened the seal and the, and the Antichrist came out. The, events that, the event that starts the tribulation period is that the Antichrist rises to power and he signs a covenant or a peace treaty with who? Israel, okay. Or what are we talking about all the time? Peace tree, the peace tree. We've been trying to get a peace tree forever, okay? It's not going to happen until the tribulation period, you know, the start of it. So they're going to strike a, a peace treaty. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Turn there in your Bibles. 
Put that on the overhead, Daniel 9.27. This is where he prophesied about this peace treaty. <clears throat> Confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Okay, so that's one seven, like a week, so it's seven years. Bless you. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings, and a wing of the temple will set up as an abomination that causes desolation till the end that his decree is poured out on him. Okay, so the Antichrist comes, he makes a treaty, peace treaty with Israel, and right in the middle of the seven year tribulation period, three and a half years, then he does something in the temple. Okay, he sets himself, sets himself up as God and he's worshipped as God. Okay. So that's the Antichrist. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. We're going to briefly review a little bit about the Antichrist. There's a lot of new people here. I want you to hear about the Antichrist. It's not going to be a chump. You don't get all the world to follow you if you're a chump. This guy is going to be quite a, quite a fellow. So, um, it says here, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man of lawlessness is the Antichrist. The man doomed to destruction. Okay, so the dude's going to come on the scene for seven years. That's it. That's his whole, right? That's his 15 minutes of faith. Okay? And Jesus is going to come back and destroy him. Okay, this is after the rapture, when the church is already gone. So if you're a believer in Jesus, Jesus comes back in clouds, doesn't set foot on the earth. We go up in the rapture, he takes us to heaven. Then that's the start of the tribulation period. Okay? That's when the Antichrist comes to power. Um, Beth Moore said the other day, Julie, my wife, was telling me that um, throughout all the centuries, they've always had people on the earth who resembled the Antichrist, like Hitler, right, or all these, these people. And Beth Moore was saying that the devil, did, he does not know when Jesus is coming back. So he's always had an Antichrist standing by just in case, because nobody knows. Not even Jesus knows when he's coming back, only the Father. So if Jesus doesn't know, the devil doesn't know. So he's always had an antichrist type of person standing by. Someone with charisma. You're going to read about it. So um, that's very interesting. The man doomed to destruction. Look at verse 4. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Look at verse 8 and 9. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth. I mean, Okay, Jesus is so much more powerful than any devil or antichrist. He just destroys it with the breath of his mouth um, and destroyed by the splendor of his coming. Just his very glory, just his presence will destroy it. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. Okay, Satan works in a strange way. He, he will use all sorts of displays of power okay, through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. This is very interesting. I want to stop here. The devil's main tactic to get us Christians to fall is through deception. He deceived Adam and Eve. Oh, Eve, you take the apple. God just doesn't want you to be like him. He just doesn't want you to have the knowledge of, and, and live forever. So, you know. And so he, he's very deceptive. He'll mix a little truth with a little lie. You see it a lot in cults. They take the Bible and they twist it just enough to get you to follow them. And so, that's deception. That's how we catch fish. And we have a beautiful little lure that looks just like food. And hiding deep inside is a hook. Okay? That's deception. We'll deceive the little fish and we'll hook him and then he'll be ours. And we'll eat him. And that's how the devil, that's how the devil works. <laughs> but he uses all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Okay? So he's going to set up a lie, a false religion. He's going to be ahead of it. He's going to get all the people to follow him. And he uses power, right, and tricks. He's very tricksy. You see the Lord of the Rings? Where's my Lord of the Rings fan? Anybody see that? Okay. Lord of the Rings fan? Anybody? Tricksy? He's very tricksy. And so he uses tricks. And so he's always used tricks. And he also has power. You know the devil has power? Yeah, supernatural power. Not nearly the supernatural power God has, but compared to us, it's 
pretty pretty tough. You remember um, when Moses threw his, his rod down, okay, turned into a snake. You know the magicians did the same trick. Okay, that's supernatural. Sticks just don't turn into snakes. There was a supernatural thing, right? So the devil has he has minor powers, right? He can't raise the dead. That's a major miracle. But he can do minor miracles, okay? Minor miracles with tricks. Have you ever seen some of these magicians on TV? Right? The guys who walk around the street and do card tricks and stuff. It blows your mind. They, they levitate. It's just a trick, but it looks so real and to the natural eye. It's people freak out on the street. And they're standing right next to him. They think he's levitating. I don't know how he does it. He probably has a stick back there. Though. <laughs> There's a trick. It's a trick. But people are fooled. They think, well, oh, he's supernatural. Chris Angel. He's supernatural, right? So they do these tricks. The devil is the trick master. He makes Chris Angel and the other guy look like chumps. So he's going to have tricks. He's going to have real power. And he's going to deceive many people. He's going to be something else. So can the Antichrist or Satan do miracles? Minor miracles. Turn to Daniel 8, 23. Talking about the Antichrist. Pastor, I came to church to hear about Jesus. We'll talk about him too. But right now we're on the Antichrist. So hold your horses. Okay. Uh, Daniel 8, 23. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, okay, a fierce-looking king, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, oh, man, will arise. Okay, let me read that again. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, okay, this is when the church is taken out of the way, the tribulation comes, people are just going to go crazy. When rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. Maybe James Bond, I don't know. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. Hear that? Whose power? He'll become very strong, but not by his own power. The power of the devil. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. And this guy's going to be a, a winner. Right? He's going to be a winner. He succeeds in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper. He will consider himself superior. Okay, that's pride, man. This guy's going to be full of pride. He's going to be good looking. Everything he does, he's going to, he's going to be uh, Midas. He's going to have the Midas touch. Um, he will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. Do you know that during the tribulation, God's holy people, the Jews, and the Christians are going to have massive, massive martyrdom. Christians are going to die. I mean, they're dying right now by the hands of ISIS. But they're going to die by the tens of thousands during the tribulation. Okay. He will destroy those who are mighty and holy. He will cause deceit to prosper. And he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes, Jesus. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power, but by God's power. Amen. Tonight I'm going to show you a video by an ex-Muslim who became a Christian then became a Bible scholar. And we're going to look at the tribulation, the Antichrist, through the eyes of the Middle Eastern mindset. We're Westerners. We don't look at the Bible the same as a Middle Easterner does, okay? And so we're thinking, you know, all these things I'll get into in a minute. But before we get into that, we've got to have some, because this guy, I'm telling you, you might fall asleep, but if you hang in there, right? This guy's deep. We're about to go deep. This guy's going to take it deep. But be, and so you're not totally confused, right? We've got to have some background material here. So get your Bible out and turn to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. You've got to know some of this stuff. He starts talking about this stuff. If you don't know it, you're going to get lost. And then it's like one of those soap operas when you come in late. Just lost. I love this, Daniel 9, 25. No one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. That's talking about 
the anointed one. This is, this was written hundreds of years before the Messiah came, Jesus. This is prophesying about Jesus coming, okay? So Jesus comes, the anointed one comes, but in times of trouble, right? The ruler comes, there will be seven, seven, six. This is, this is describing, it is telling you how many, how many years it's going to be until the Messiah rides into town on the donkey. It will be rebuilt. The, talk about the temple. Jerusalem, <laughs> the temple will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, they'll be under the persecution of the Romans. Verse 26, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one, that's Jesus, will be put to death. Okay? So here they are, Daniel. The Jews pronounce it Daniel. And Daniel is prophesying Jesus is coming after the temple's built, but in times of trouble during the Roman, didn't, didn't say Roman, but in times of trouble, and then the anointed one will be cut off. Okay? There's no mistake in this, man. So, the uh, anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler will come. The Romans, basically, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know what date that happened. Jesus died. The sanctuary was destroyed in 70 A.D., right? 40 years after Jesus died. Okay, so we, we know what he, when he's talking about. And so, those who were living then, they realized, hey, the temple was destroyed, just like Daniel said. And the Messiah came right before the temple was destroyed. Who was that? Who came right before the temple was destroyed that looked like the Messiah? None other than Jesus. So the end. Okay, the people of the ruler will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. Okay? And desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Okay? What covenant? We, we just read about it. Uh, that covenant, right? He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering at the temple. He will set up an abomination of desolation. Okay, now turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 29. Daniel 2, 29. Now, here's, here's two uh, visions. Here's two dreams that you have to know to know Bible prophecy. Okay? There's really three in Daniel. All we're going to talk about tonight is two do okay. you remember Nebuchadnezzar? He had a dream. He called Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, I want you guys to come. He got all the astrologers. He said, I had a dream. Incredible dream, and I want you guys to interpret for me. And then the astrologers said, oh, sure, tell us your dream, and we'll tell you the interpretation. He said, no, I'm very firm on this. I am not telling you my dream. You tell me my dreams and the interpretation. And they're like... And he said, if you don't tell me my dream and the interpretation of my dream, you're going to die. And all of your family, he just didn't kill one. He went after the whole family. So they said, no one can do this. No one can tell you a dream. And so Daniel said, give me time. Right? He said to the king's guard, he said, give me time. So he went and he got all these guys to fast and pray. And God gave him the vision. Okay, so that's, that's this vision that we're looking at. So put that up on the overhead. Daniel 2. Is that yeah. Daniel 2. Okay, as your majesty was lying there. Okay, now Daniel's talking to the king. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. Okay, this is a future thing. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have great, greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty, majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty, your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue. Okay. Do you have that in your notes? Do you have that in your notes? One of the colored things. Okay. You see the statue? Yes. That's it. There's the box. Okay, here it is. Down at the bottom, you got two columns here. You got Daniel 2, you got Daniel 7. And then on the right side, you have the interpretation. Each of the parts of the statue, okay, and the bear, the leopard, and the lion, and what those future kingdoms are to the right column. Okay, you got that? Thank you. Okay, as we read this, I want you to look to the far right column to figure out who is what, okay? What kingdoms are coming? Future kingdoms. So a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. Verse 32. 
The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms of silver. Okay? Okay, who's the head? Babylon. Okay. The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms of silver. Is that still Babylon? Medo Persia. Okay. The Assyrians took all the Jews away, and then the Babylonians attacked the Assyrians, took the Jews from them, and then the Medo Persians, this is real history, attacked them. The Medo Persians did. Attacked the Babylonians, took the Jews, and uh, they let them go back to their homeland. Okay. So the statue, the, the head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron. His feet partly of iron. Okay, let's stop there. Where are the legs? Rome? Okay. And his legs of iron, his feet partly of iron and clay, and partly of baked clay. Okay, what is the baked feet? Ten nations. Okay, now that's talking about the future. That's talking about the end times where the Antichrist is coming out of. Okay? The feet baked of clay. Sort of maybe like the European Union. Okay? They're all one, but they're not really that. They're like iron and clay. They're together, but they're not that together. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze and the silver and the gold were broken all to pieces. It became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Dude, and, and Nebuchadnezzar's gone. That's amazing. You knew it. Okay? Who's the rock? Jesus. Okay? So the ten nations are going to produce the Antichrist, and then the rock is just going to come out and just smash them all to pieces then fill the earth for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ, okay? So that's talking about the near future, Babylon, Assyria, Medo-Persians, Greece, okay? And then it goes on to the ten nation kingdoms at the very end. Okay, now let's go over to chapter 7. Does it give a verse on that chapter? Okay, Daniel's dream of four beasts, okay? Now this is a different dream, but it means the same thing. Okay, so we have them right there. You got your sheets. Look at that. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. Okay, Daniel's having a dream. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven turning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Four great beasts. Are you following me? Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Four great beasts. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. Okay, these same beasts are also in Revelation chapter 17. Okay, the first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked and there before me was another beast, one like that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that in my vision at night I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns, okay? Here's the ten again. Ten nations in the future, okay? During the tribulation, there's going to be a conglomeration of ten nations, and out of that is going to come the Antichrist. So while I was thinking about the horn, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully, okay? Did the Antichrist set himself up to be like God? Was very superior, very boastful. As I looked, thrones were set up in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Who's the Ancient of Days? Jesus. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. 
river of fire was flowing, coming out, out from before him, and thousands upon thousands attended him, to ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. Okay, so there's the second vision. Okay, now get ready with the video. You just need to hear some background material. This guy. Let me watch you get that up. Go full screen, push play, and someone get the lights. Thank you. Okay, hold, push pause one second. And can you go past that guy? Go past to Waleed. He kind of introduces Waleed. Um, the traditional teaching, okay, put it on hold. Throw the lights back on just for one more second. I want to, I got a more precious material. The traditional teaching of the ten nation kingdoms, okay? This is what I heard as a child growing up, is the, the, the Catholic Church or the Holy Roman Empire, okay? And the Antichrist was the Catholic Church. I've been hearing that all my life. That's a Western, okay, we're Western. That's a Western interpretation of the Bible. But I heard this the other day from an Eastern perspective, and I thought, you got to hear it, right? Okay, so there's some things that are rock solid, I believe, in Bible prophecy. There are some things that can have a couple different interpretations. So this will be one of them. Who is the Antichrist? Where does it come from? And I want you to hear what Walid says. So uh, do the lights and do the video. It's rarely talked about these days, and that is the subject of eschatology. Not just eschatology from a Christian perspective, that is, but eschatology from an Islamic perspective. Because most Westerners, especially Christians that read the Bible, they don't really look at certain parts of what the other guys are thinking about them. They read the Bible from a Western lens and they interpret the Bible from a Western perspective, um, yet not aware that the Bible itself had so many warnings about the threat of fundamental Islam. Now, when it comes to the issue of the mindset of a Muslim fundamentalist, what is the enemy, the Islamic radicals, the fundamentalists, the terrorists, the nations that want to destroy the West, if you want to believe me, uh, like Iran, uh, Sudan, Somalia, the Palestinians, there are an array of nations that are bent on establishing an Islamic system worldwide. Now, we're going to run through a journey, go through a journey, if you will, to look at the different aspects and parts biblically and Islamically to see what is the mindset of our enemy when it comes to the ends of times. I think I've shared in the past about the Islamic eschatological perspective in which the Prophet of Islam said that the day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations and then the trees and stones will cry out, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come all Muslim, come and kill him. This is the solution to the Jewish problem from an Islamic eschatological view. And that is, the world will end when the Islamic nations surrounding Israel will attack Israel and basically destroy all the men. Of course, the women be taken as concubines in this case. However, when I read the Bible in 1993, I was shocked to find the similar story to this one was written in the books of Zechariah and other books as well. In, in Zechariah chapters 12 and chapters 14, I will make Jerusalem a trembling cup to all surrounding nations. The houses will be rifled and the women ravished. And then it talks about the continuation of the story. The outcome of this battle will be the victory of Israel through the Messiah who will come and aid the Jewish people and destroy the surrounding nations, which, by the way, when I was Muslim, I learned that these nations basically are Islamic nations coming against Israel. Now, how in the world did Islam have the same story in Islamic eschatology that was written in the Bible, yet Muhammad talked about it, yet the outcome of the battle is the victory of Islam. Once you begin to parallel all the different stories in the Bible regarding the ends of times, you will find parallels of these same stories 
in Islamic eschatology with the outcome of the battle giving the victory to Islam. I was shocked when I read uh, Zechariah, uh, Amos, Joel. In fact, in Joel chapter 3, it says clearly regarding the judgment of the nations coming against Israel. And in Joel 3, it says, I will gather all nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and then I will enter into judgment there with them. That's the Messiah. That's God Almighty coming in the flesh to judge the surrounding nations. I will judge them there on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. I was very shocked to read the division of the land of Israel being mentioned in eschatological uh, references in the Bible. Because all my life as a Palestinian, as a Muslim radical, I wanted nothing but the eradication of Israel and the establishment of a Palestinian state. We seem to have succeeded somewhat because today the whole world is focused on creating a Palestinian state. This is why it's very crucial to think about this whole issue of which you support, either the establishment of a Palestinian state if you are pro-Palestine or the establishment of a Jewish state if you are pro-Israel. So we have a division, if you will, that the Bible, you know, calls that this division between these nations is as nations that supported the rights for Israel versus the nations that wanted to condemn and destroy Israel. In fact, when you compare, you begin to compare these eschatological Islamic views, you will find that the Prophet of Islam even declared that at some point in time there will be a war with the Muslim world coming against Israel that comes from the area of Khurasan, this is the Arabic word for Persia, and coming uh, alongside with Turkey in an alliance of Islamic nations coming against Israel to destroy Israel. In fact, the Prophet of Islam says, every Muslim must join this battle, even if they have to crawl on snow. While these Islamic references uh, regarding a culmination of a battle of Muslim nations coming on Israel might seem to be strange to many of, in the modern West. However, the problem arises that when you examine eschatology and books written by uh, modern Bible teachers, you will find that many of these references to Muslim nations don't much exist in their writings. In other words, the Western uh, uh, books that regard prophecy are usually Eurocentric. They believe in a view that when the Antichrist comes, that he comes from the European Union, if you will. And he comes leading a coalition of European countries coming to fight the state of Israel. However, there is a problem with this view because if we examine the Bible, we will find that the majority of the Bible, when it comes to nations being referenced in the Bible in literal form, we will find out that most of these nations, or even all of them, are today Muslim fundamentalists. In fact, I have created three challenges for any of my Western friends to examine to see whether I am right or whether I am wrong. And here are the three challenges. Challenge number one, did the Western scholars or did Christian scholars of traditional times like the church fathers and old interpreters of Bible prophecy interpret a Eurocentric view when it comes to the ends of time? Maybe if we examine some of these, we'll find out that the modern interpreters have missed out on a huge amount of information that's been given to us in the past. People ask me all the time, because I believe in an Islamic view, in an Islamic-centric view, that these nations that come against Israel are mostly Islamic nations, even including this whole issue with Antichrist coming from Europe, I don't agree with, and I will attribute the Antichrist coming from the eastern parts of a revival of a Roman Empire. Some people might object. I like to use an argument that uh, I have seen that Jesus have used in the past. 
whenever you take uh, the ways Jesus did things, he always challenged issues with asking questions. They have asked Jesus one time, you know, the Pharisees, when they gathered together and came and asked him, by what right do you speak these things? By what right do you claim to be Messiah? And he referred them to John the Baptist. And he asked them a question. Was John the Baptist from God or did he speak on his own accord? Had the Pharisees said that he spoke in his own accord, well, the crowds believed that John the Baptist was a prophet. The Pharisees would have been stoned. Had they said, well, John the Baptist was a prophet, well, Jesus said, well, he pointed to me as the Messiah. So this is what I call question Jesus style or checkmate Jesus style. And may I ask the same question? By what right did Martin Luther, who wrote about Islam being the body, embodiment of the beast system, sure, Martin Luther did teach that the Catholic Church was the harlot of Babylon, but he also said that the physical beast of the Bible, uh, that regarding the Antichrist, it really is the body of Islam. It is the combinations of Islamic nations. It's a combination of Islamic unity coming against Israel. All the traditional, almost all the traditional interpreters of the Bible included Islam being part of the Antichrist and being even the beast himself. In fact, if we examine even uh, Calvin, John Calvin taught that Islam was the advent of Antichrist. If we examine Sir Robert Anderson, who unlocked the 70 weeks of Daniel in his fantastic book, The Coming Prince, he even said that when we examine the revival of the Roman Empire, we must concentrate on the eastern parts of the Roman Empire, that is, Egypt and Turkey, not Rome. But it wasn't only Martin Luther or John Calvin or Sir Robert Anderson that taught an Islamic-centric view regarding Antichrist. You have others like Hosea Lynch who said that the majority of Protestant teachers agree that Islam was the advent of the coming of Antichrist. It was the system of the beast. That even uh, uh, many others like Fox the Book of Martyrs, the author of the Fox of the Book of Martyrs, he also said that Islam is the Antichrist system. In fact, the martyrs of Cordova. Why do they call them the martyrs of Cordova? Well, they chose to be martyred in Spain when they went to, they had been taken to the Islamic court system because they were interpreting in the Bible that the Antichrist was Muslim. And the judge, the Muslim judge, gave them a choice of recanting their interpretation or being beheaded for what they have done, they chose to be beheaded to preserve their interpretation so you now can know about the truth regarding Islam being the Antichrist of what the Bible said. The majority of Protestant teachers of traditional time taught that Islam was the Antichrist. This is something not new. It is something that died out when the Ottoman Empire was wounded an Islamic system basically collapsed in 1924. Modern interpreters began to look other places, forgetting that the Bible warned that the beast has one of his heads being wounded. In other words, one of its empires has been wounded and it will revive itself in the ends of times. While this is difficult to explain in half hour or one hour, it is written in my book, God's War and Terror in detail. It is difficult to explain it in one session. However, I must go through the rest of the challenges in order to make my viewer here think about truly what the Bible taught regarding the ends of times. The second challenge that I give is this. When we look at all the literal references in the Bible, in other words, all the nations that God destroyed in the Bible in the ends of times, the burden against Arabia, Damascus will be destroyed in one day, those kinds of things. In all the references in the Bible in which the literal names of the nations that God shows in which they are destroyed in the ends of times, did you know that every single one of them is Muslim? 
In fact, I know what you're thinking about. What about the kings of the East? Isn't that China that comes against Israel at the end of times? After all, they will lead 200 million man army. Yet if you examine the text in the Bible, nowhere does it say the word China at all. It simply says kings from the East. And if you, we want to apply hermeneutical perspective, a hermeneutical method of interpreting scripture that is, we must look at other parts in the Bible in which it talked about wise men from the East or kings from the East. They came to worship the king in our village in Bethlehem. They came and brought incense, frankincense, and myrrh. All scholars agree that these came from the regions of Babylonia and Persia. Today would be Muslim countries. So why would the kings of the East here be Babylonia and Persia, and the kings of East there be China? By what right do we have this interpretation? By what hermeneutical method did we use to interpret kings of the East to be China? Second of all, it is plural kings and not one king. China is but one leader. This is talking about several nations with several leaders coming east of the Euphrates to attack Israel. Now, if we look east of the Euphrates, what do we find? We find Iraq. Today we're having a big problem there. We find Iran, all Muslim. Uh, east of that, we will find you know, Afghanistan, and then you will find Pakistan, and then you will find Indonesia, all Muslim regions, and likely to come against Israel, and they seem to fit the bill of being, you know, east of the Euphrates, and can be called kings from the east. There is no other nation mentioned in the Bible in destruction that is a non-Muslim nation including Rome, the very city that many think there is the nation of Italy or Rome coming against <laughs> Israel at the end of time. Did you know that Rome is mentioned 16 times in the Bible? Not one reference in destruction. Did God forget to mention the destruction of Rome? Indeed, if what the Bible was talking about was Rome. And I know what you're thinking about. You're saying, well, what about the seven hills of Rome? Isn't that in the Bible? The seven hills? The seven mountains? Yet the problem with many of this Western modernistic view, that is, is that they don't look at the entire text of Revelation 13 or Revelation 17 regarding the woman riding on a scarlet beast with seven heads. And there are also seven mountains. Remember, they're not just seven mountains. But there are seven heads. And there are also seven kings. Kings don't rule mountains. Kings rule kingdoms. There are seven kingdoms or empires who were who ruled by seven kings. John was saying, five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. Sure, from John's perspective, the kingdoms that fell in the past are well known. John was sitting in the sixth kingdom, which is the Roman Empire, and he's saying five have fallen. Well, simply put, you have Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, uh, Middle Persia, and the Grecian Empire, the fifth empire, fell, and he was sitting on the Roman. Five have fallen. What is? And the other has not yet come. He was talking about number seven and not number six. So who was the seventh nation or empire that came after the Roman Empire? Now, if you examine history, uh, the Roman Empire ceased to exist, stopped existing in Rome and continued to exist in its eastern parts in Constantinople. In fact, it was called the uh, Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire existed for hundreds of years afterwards and still was called the Roman Empire. It fell at whose hands? It fell on the hands of the Muslims. The Ottoman Empire, Muhammad II in 1453, took the mantle from the Roman Empire. He was the seventh king. This was the seventh kingdom that the Bible talked about. In fact, that interpretation is not a private interpretation. It was very commonly known in ancient times. In fact, the Bible continues to say, the one that was, yet is not, the number seven, that is, is himself also the eighth. Aha! Uh -huh. 
Number seven, the seventh head that, that is, or the seventh mountain that is, was wounded in the head and its wound was healed. It revives again. The Islamic empire will come again in the ends of times and this seems to be collaborated with all the literal texts mentioned in scripture, every single reference in the Bible that mentions the name of the nations that God destroys in the ends of times, every single one is Muslim. Wow. Okay, that That's challenge number two. That's good. You turn it off. Challenge number Wow. Okay, so. Sorry about the um, lip speak. I was thinking of the. But isn't that interesting, though? Yeah. Yeah. And it makes so much sense. All the, 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 the kingdoms that come against. Israel are the surrounding nations, and the East, that was just amazing. Did you fall asleep during that? I thought it was fascinating. I'm sorry if I'm boring you with that. Some people walk out, maybe they had something to do with it. But, um, turn, get your sheet, the one with the uh, color, color on it. I want to go through this real quick. And we'll go over this next week, too. Okay, go to the second sheet. First part is about the Antichrist. You can read that. Look down. Um, see, it says the false prophet called Isa. You know, the Muslims are waiting for their 12th Imam. Okay, they're waiting for their Messiah. Okay, so when their Messiah comes, it's not going to be their Messiah, it's going to be the Antichrist. So they're waiting for their guy. We're waiting for the Antichrist. Our guy's already come, Jesus. Okay. They're, they're waiting for their 12th Imam. And what they're trying to do is take over the world to bring, to, to bring it about. They've already taken over almost all of Northern Africa, all of the Middle East. And they're moving on into Europe. Right now, what's happening in Europe? There's a massive migration of Islam into Europe. And the, the uh, European nations are so politically correct that they can't say no. Oh, it's just four women and children. No, it's not. It's like nine out of ten of them are all young males, 18 to 30 years old. And they're chanting uh, Allah Akbar, and they're fighting with the police. And, and their preachers, one of their uh, imams said, you go, into, you go into Europe, you populate Europe, and you take it over. That's their goal. So if the Roman Empire... If, if the Roman Empire is Europe and it's taken over by Islam, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Then it can be Islam. So um, we have a lot going on right now, right before our eyes. A lot of prophecy of scripture being fulfilled right before our eyes. So don't think all these little cute little Muslims going into Europe. ISIS is driving them there for a purpose. They could go east to uh, Saudi Arabia, right? Qatar. I mean, all the Muslim nations, and they said no. Saudi Arabia said, we can't take any of them because they might be terrorists. <laughs> That's what they said. Well, no, duh. ISIS is amongst them, right? ISIS is embedded. Now, our president wants to take 100,000 a year. John Kerry said we want to take 100,000 of these. Um, and they're not, from, they're not from Syria. They're from the other nations around there. They're from Iraq, OK? They're from Libya. And so we're gullible thinking, oh, these are just poor little women and children who've been kicked out because of war. They've been purposely driven to Europe, to populate Europe. ISIS knows what they're doing. The Muslim Brotherhood and ISIS, they're all the same. Muslim Brotherhood is controlling everybody. And they, are, they know what they're doing. And they pushed them. They didn't push them east to Saudi Arabia, where they have plenty of land. <laughs> Iran, Iraq, plenty of land, OK? Those people are closed their borders. They're pushing all these people to Europe. They're going to take over Europe. Because they don't have enough guts. They're politically correct. They can't say anything bad about anybody. Hurt their feelings. Their whole country, their nationality, everything's going to be taken over by Islam. It's happening right before our eyes. I'm not making this up. It's just happening. And so the Antichrist surely could, makes a lot of sense to me, come out of the Muslim nations. So let's read on our sheet here. Islam believes an animal will come speaking, calling people to Islam. In Revelation 13, the false prophet causes an image to speak, and the image demands the people bow down and worship the beast. That's Islam believes that two will come preaching another religion, 
and will be killed. The Bible teaches about the two witnesses. You heard about the two witnesses in Revelation? Okay, it's Enoch and Elijah. A lot of people say, oh, it's Moses and Elijah. But uh, they have different theories on this. But Enoch and Elijah are the only two people who never saw death. Right? They didn't die. God took them away. So he's going to bring them back to be the witnesses in Jerusalem during the tribulation. Just makes sense to me. Okay? So read the next one. The real key, the Antichrist will deny the deity of Jesus and the relationship between the Father and the Son. Islam accepts Jesus as a prophet but says he is not the Son of God. God has no Son. Okay? Then the next one says the false prophet will claim to be Islamic Jesus through his miracles. Problem is, Islamic Jesus will not have scars in his hands. Okay? The Antichrist will not have scars like Jesus. Uh, Jesus will represent Christianity without a cross. Or Islamic Jesus will represent Christianity without a cross. Islamic Jesus will lead all men to Islam. He sets up an image to be worshipped, kissed towards. That's what they did in Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar and the three Hebrew children. In Revelation, it meant to kiss the ring of the emperor. The false prophet will deny that Jesus is the son of God. The false prophet will use Mary as a connection between both religions. Interesting. Islam uses prayer beads without a cross. Catholicism uses prayer beads with a cross. The Spirit is already at work now denying Jesus. The Spirit of the Antichrist is in the church. Secondly, there is an Antichrist, one person. The Spirit of the Antichrist will precede the person of the Antichrist. So the Spirit of the Antichrist will precede the person of the Antichrist. Okay? Already there is a Spirit of Antichrist in the world today. Right? Anti-Christian bigotry is going on all the time. One lady was just put in jail for her faith. Okay? So, thirdly, the spirit of the Antichrist is the spirit that operates throughout the economical, political, religious, and governmental systems. It's everywhere. So the Antichrist will begin in some way to associate with the people of the world system. Wow. Okay, let's save the rest until next week. There's a lot going on. Amen? We'll talk about Read chapter uh, 17 of Revelation. Talk about the whore of Babylon. That's a bad word. <laughs> but it's in the Bible. You're allowed to say it. Okay, so we're talking about the, the whore of Babylon. We're talking about the 12th Imam. Talk about the United Nations. Okay. The whole world will come against Israel through the United Nations that could happen. Okay. Any questions? Any comment? Yes, Fred. It's ironic that uh, Ben Carson would be talking about how an Islamic person would not be should not be a person. Right. Ben Carson is a surgeon, one of the leading surgeons in the world. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. Because Sharia law and our constitution are not compatible. You can't worship Sharia and be a free person. Because women are not free in Sharia law. Women and children are persecuted under Sharia law. In America, we're all free. Okay. Who else has to get there? Yeah, yeah. Can't hear. He's saying the Pope is saying bring all the Syrian refugees here to America. Yeah. But you do, you know we already bring in 100,000 uh, Muslim immigrants to America every year. Okay? So we're doing our part. We're like doing 15 billion times more than the Muslim countries. Okay? Or the Saudi. They haven't taken any. Okay? And then they, then they say, oh, you Americans are bad people. We're already taking 100,000 Muslims every year into America. Okay? They're all going to Dearborn and they're making their little enclaves. You know, Dearborn, Michigan, they have the prayer, Muslim prayer towers, and they, they have the Muslim call of prayer every morning. You know that, that sound? Yeah. The only one to make it's just hitting them. They hear that. They're not allowed to ring church bells in Dearborn, but you, they, everybody has to hear that nasty call of prayer that our president says is the most beautiful sound he's ever heard. Oh, Muslim call of prayer. Yeah. He said that. So. Okay. Yes, Mary. Uh, Pensacola has already take, 
going to take in Assyrians as refugees. Wow. Yeah. That's that she point. said Pensacola's already agreed to take in Assyrian refugees. They'll come to our church. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Scary stuff. You know, in America, we had immigration. We had the Statue of Liberty. They come through Ellis Island. We had thousands, thousands of immigrants come to America. But you know, that was back in the early part of the century. But you know, after after that, we stopped immigration to nothing. And our leaders said, we brought in all these people. Let's give them time to get assimilated before we bring any more in. They stopped it in the first half of, the, of this 1900s. So yeah, we brought people in, but then we stopped to get, let them get assimilated. Makes sense to me. There's times when you just need to stop and let them get assimilated. And, and if you're worshiping Allah and you're following the Sharia, will never assimilate into America. You won't. They're, yes, sir. Uh, our church that we visited in Paris and did the mission trip before, they are ministering to these Arabs, or um, Islamics, and many of them are being saved. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. good. Oh. Oh. All right. Well, while we stand our feet, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Be what it is. <laughs> Our heads. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you, Father. We just thank you for all this eye-opening stuff. Lord, the end times are happening right before our very eyes. We can easily see how the uh, one world government can come out and the Antichrist can rise up. And Lord, we just pray that we keep our eyes open and we watch for the clouds when Jesus is going to come back. And Lord, that we'll get our lives right. We'll get sin out of our lives so when Jesus comes back for his bride that we'll be white and spotless. Lord, that we won't be sinners. So we'll be saints. So Lord, let us hate sin and love God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Turn around, shake.